Where's everybody from? So I don't know, maybe introductions because we're so yeah, small. Be All right, so I'll start. So I'm, so I'm, I'm Michael Chung. I'm a radiation oncologist uh, down in Miami at Miami Cancer Institute, which is part of Baptist. So I'm obviously giving the first set of talks here. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, Yazan Abud at PGY5, Moffitt Cancer Center, Tampa, Florida. Okay. I'm Ahmed, I'm from New Jersey, Rutgers, PGY5. Awesome. My name's Albert, I'm in practice in Houston, Texas. Okay, great. I'm Virginia Gorsia, I practice in Tampa, Florida. Oh, you're in Tampa? Oh, which part? I was in, well, I was at Moffitt before I trained there, so. Where, where, where in Tampa are you? Oh, so you, you, okay, you cover different places. I see. Okay. Hi. Um, my name's Tamara. I'm a PGY5 at UK. Just, you know, an hour and a half. Oh, okay. Awesome. I'm a module also at UAB. At UAB. Oh, okay. You know Hunter Boggs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was one of, my, one of my residents. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, when, when I was at University of Maryland. So, I think I saw. We have a few more people joining you guys. <laughs> They're just not in yet. So, if you guys, again, need anything, just let me know. Okay? All right. All right. Awesome. Thanks. All right, who's excited to start with lymphoma? <laughs> What's that? It's tricky. Yeah, it is a little tricky. Speaking of lymphoma, I know I sent you guys an email regarding um, what Chung is doing lymphoma sessions this afternoon. She does have the three sessions open. You do have to miss a half hour of the lecture that's going on to meet with him, but it is definitely worth it, I promise. Especially if I know you're all going to pass this year, so you'll be coming back to the oral next year. It's a good way to get an idea of how we do the orals and how what to expect compared to the orals after you pass your clinic. So mm -hmm. which one would be that for you? Just come see me. Uh, just to set up. So you just got to take that yourself. Okay? All right. All right. Let's get started, okay? All right. So the morning will be broken down. So we'll start with Hodgkin. Uh, Hodgkin uh, lymphoma. We'll go to non-Hodgkin, and then we'll go to myeloma plus mesotoma, which the last talk's pretty quick. Um, so we should finish a little bit early. Uh, so does anybody actually treat lymphoma here? I mean, just as a subspecialty or a focus? No? Okay. So um, just curious. So, you know, actually, w through these talks, I will try to highlight what I think are um, more important uh, nuances or details to focus on. Some of the information here is really just for completeness sake, and while I, of course, don't know what the written exam questions are, um, you know, I can, I can tell you, I think, with some good uh, uh, level of confidence what may or may not be asked, but of course, um, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll try to focus on what I think is the most more relevant information. So. You know, just for some uh, quick background, um, Hodgkin lymphoma was really described in the 1980s uh, and really was the primary mode of treating these patients until uh, more uh, modern forms of chemotherapy came around. You know, I think it's important here to recognize that these are, number one, it's a pretty rare disease, but also the bimodal distribution of this disease. So you typically see this uh, in young people in their 20s or 30s, but also you can see it in older folks. Um, so, in particular, if you, if, you, if you have a patient who comes to you who is young in their 20s, you know, 25-year-old uh, female or whatnot, I mean, it's, it's probably more likely a Hodgkin versus a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but of course, um, it, it could go either way. But there is this bimodal distribution of disease. Also, of course, recognizing the differences between general patterns and characteristics of Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So, um, you know, Hodgkin lymphoma is typically... Uh, localized to single nodal groups. You had this contiguous versus non-contiguous spread uh, with Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin. You rarely involve mesenteric nodes, walled iris ring. And extranodal involvement with Hodgkin lymphoma is possible, but it's really not um, as common as with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, this is just for, inform for your information for risk factors. I don't, um, you know, I, I would recognize that EBV is a contributing factor in some patients, and for some subtypes, it's more common than others, and we'll look at that. Um, of course, there's classical Hodgkin lymphoma and nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma. It's, of course, critical that you recognize these two entities and differences between the two in terms of um, various clinical and pathologic differences, and we'll go through those. So, your first question. So, classical Hodgkin lymphoma, in terms of CD15 
is that typically positive or negative? Everyone think positive? Okay, positive. CD30? Positive. CD20? Is it always negative? No. No. Okay. Yeah, so roughly 20 or maybe 30% of the time it can be um, it can be positive, but it typically is negative, okay? And then CD45 is negative, okay. Um, so for nodular lymphocyte predominant, what would it be? Yeah, so it's sort of the reverse, right? And here's just a quick table for you to go back if you want a reference. But again, the CD markers are important to, to know in order to, to recognize the, so it's possible that, you know, you could get a patient, 25-year-old, with some nodal disease, it looks like lymphoma, these are the CD markers you get, and then you need to decipher whether that's a classical versus a nodular lymphocyte predominant case in order to figure out what's the best management option, for example. So these are the classical uh, Hodgkin lymphoma subtypes, um, nodular sclerosing, mixed cellularity, lymphocyte rich and poor. Um, I would generally, you know, well, there's some slides uh, about each of these, I mean, generally, you should know what the subtypes are. Um, you should know that the most common of these is nodular sclerosing Hodgkin lymphoma. It's typically in young adults, and there's not an association with EBV here. Uh, and they have a very good prognosis. I would not focus that much on details here, other than, of course, the, the pathognomonic Reed-Sternberg cell, which really is, is something that occupies probably then le less than 1% of, of all of the all of the cells that you, that you see in the, and here we go, comprises less than 1% of cells involved in the tissue. But reed sternberg cell, you know, um, obviously important to remember. So mixed cellularity, this is typically older adults. There's a greater association with EBV, but I think an association with abdominal involvement is something to keep in mind. So more commonly, you have abdominal nodes that are involved with mixed cellularity as opposed to nodular uh, sclerosing and, and other subtypes. And then so the workup actually for these patients would be a bit different. So you would, always, you know, you would want to include um, uh, evaluation, so an upper GI series, et cetera, okay? And we'll talk about that. I, I wouldn't worry about the nuances here. So lymphocyte rich, um, this is not as common. It's an older folks. It has a very good prognosis. <clears throat> Morphologically can resemble nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin lymphoma because they're both lymphocyte rich. Um, but the, Im the immunohistochemical um, information that you get is important to distinguish. So these are typically CD20 negative as opposed to positive, where the nodular lymphocyte predominant is. And then lymphocyte depleted, uh, worse prognosis, um, not, not as common. I wouldn't worry about too much of it. You know, these can also involve abdominal nodes as well, but I think you tend to get l less commonly asked about this entity. But um, the prognosis tends to be the worst with, with this um, subtype. Do you, do you want to keep the questions to the end? Um, no, you can, we, we can, it's a small group, so we can. Yeah, so the, so what would be the, what would be the most favorable prognosis of all of these? For the, the rich. For the rich, right, okay. exactly. So, um, the nodular sclerosing tends to have a better prognosis than the mixed cellularity, and then the lymphocyte poor tends to have the worst prognosis of them, okay? So what is the most common presentation in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma? Is it dyspnea, chest pain, asymptomatic lymphadenopathy, fever, or pruritus? Everyone think lymphadenopathy? Yes? Okay. So yeah. So knowing how these patients present is important. So the vast majority present with asymptomatic lymphadenopathy, typically of the cervical lymph nodes and of um, the mediastinum. But of course, you can have less common involvement below the diaphragm. Um, actually, I'll go back. So what, is, what are B symptoms? I, this is not a, so what are, what are B symptoms since it's a small group? Fever, night sweat, and weight loss greater than 10. Okay, so fever greater than what temperature? Okay, or in Celsius? 38, okay. So night sweats, what kind of night sweats? Drenching, like drenching the, sh the sheets, you have to change your clothes night sweats, right? And what sort of weight loss? In six months, okay, good. 
So obviously knowing that is important in staging these patients too, right? So knowing if it's, for example, a 1A versus a 1B, and that very well could be asked, okay? So the workup for these patients, um, you know, obviously you want to ask if there are B symptoms, you want to do a good nodal evaluation, um, cardiac pulmonary status, which relates to the ABVD chemotherapy that these patients will get, um, but otherwise, and this is, I think, more for folks taking the oral boards, you want to obviously remember, um, you know, these are typically, there are many of these patients are young, um, you want to discuss fertility, um, preservation, and, and infertility counseling, okay? Uh, PET scan, bone marrow biopsy, really now not is, is not really a standard of care unless the PET scan really is clearly abnormal. It used to be more where if you had stage three or four disease or recurrent disease, you would get a, a bone marrow, but um, now it really is not uh, something that you would do unless there's PET scan abnormality. Excisional, um, excisional uh, biopsy is the preferred biopsy method, okay? So it's not a core needle biopsy. If, so if you're given both options, the answer is excisional biopsy. If you, for some reason, do not get an excisional biopsy, core needle is acceptable, but it is not preferred. And an FNA is not adequate. And so why is an FNA not adequate? Because you need to look at the nodal architecture that the FNA does not give you, okay? So staging, I won't go into, I mean, I assume that you're all familiar with this, but in general, if you're looking at stage one disease, it's a single nodal region. Stage two is multiple uh, uh, nodal regions of, uh, on one side of the diaphragm. Three is both sides of the diaphragm. And then four is if you have diffuse uh, involvement of extra, extra lymphatic organs or tissues, okay? So if you, and, and so in terms of the nodal regions, so most of the data that we use is based on the German Hodgkin study group trials, okay? So there's a number of different nodal grouping strategies. So here this table has the Ann Arbor, the EORTC, and the German Hodgkin. I would tell you most likely, and just for clinical practice as well, the vast majority of the, of the time you're really talking about or focusing on the German Hodgkin nodal classification. You know, so for example, you know, we, we, we treat people according to, you know, early favorable Hodgkin patients, the HD10 trial, or unfavorable, it tends to be, a lot of time be the HD11 trial. So how do you stage those patients in those trials is, you know, it's, you would go back to how, how um, the German Hodgkin nodal regions are, are, are defined. So, I mean, this is an important thing, I would say one of the most important things, because I think staging is, can be highlighted, especially for lymphoma questions, uh, whether written or oral boards. So we'll do a multiple choice question. So how many lymph node regions, if you had a patient with right cervical, superclav, infraclav, and axilla, per the German Hodgkin? Okay, so I heard two. Does anyone else think differently? So everyone thinks two. Okay. Okay, so we said cervical, superclav, and infraclav, so per the German Hodgkin, that's one group, okay? Um, axilla is, um, so this is actually a typo here. So axilla is two, so it is two. So sorry, there's a typo in this, on this uh, slide. So if you had, so you know, a commonly asked question is, and I think it's actually maybe the next question I had on here. Actually, I did have it on here, so it is two here. So if you just had a left cervical and superclav nodal involvement, what stage would that be per the German? So that would be one, okay? So they like to ask these type of things where you think it might be two, but you really have to know that it's one. So one is correct. Um, also just being aware of the Cotswold modification. So um, A or B for B symptoms or not, bulky disease. You know, there's, there are different definitions of what is bulky. You'll see 7.5 used in some trials or greater than 10 in some trials. You know, I would say for all intents and purposes, the questions really should be pretty clear as to whether, you know, I, I doubt anyone would give you a, you know, a six centimeter. I mean, it's sort of, it's really the, the questions really are, the question, the, 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 those writing the questions really are instructed to make it pretty, pretty obvious if it's bulky or not. And then extra nodal or not would be E, so. So if you had a, so this is a what is the stage question. So if you had a 34 year old, with 39 centi uh, centigrade um, temperature, with this 
plain film finding, but otherwise no disease. So assume this is all the disease that they have. 